What's an SDS page loading buffer? There are four or five main ingredients. SDS, so sodium dodecyl sulfate. This is a detergent, so an artificial soap. It's going to denature or unfold the proteins. It's going to keep them soluble in that unfolded state. And it's going to give them a negative charge. And this charge is going to be proportional to their length, so we can separate them based on their length. If we want to break up disulfide crosslinks, we add a reducing agent like DTT or BME. We have a buffering agent to keep pH stable, typically tris. Glycerol, so our samples don't float out of the wells when we're loading them. And a tracking dye, usually bromophenol blue, which is going to allow us to kind of track the gel's progress and know when to turn off the electricity. So that was just an overview, and now let's go one by one into each of these different components and see how they're working and why we need them. The first is SDS, the thing that makes an SDS page uh, an SDS page. So SDS stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate, and it's a detergent, so it's an artificial soap. And it has this structure where it has this long lippity tail, so this long like fatty greasy tail, and this hydrophilic or water-loved head, this negatively charged head. And what's going to happen is SDS is going to act as a denaturing agent. So a denature means to like unfold, but it's only breaking up the like weak interactions. So kind of like charge or partial charge based attractions, but not actual like real covalent bonds. So nothing where you're sharing electrons say. And why we need to do this is we need to unfold these proteins, assuming that we're doing a denaturing gel, which is what you're doing in an SDS page, you need to unfold the proteins so that what you're doing is you're separating them based on their length. Into... Let's start by just thinking about what our goal is in SDS page. Our goal is to separate proteins based on their size or more accurately based on their length, so how many amino acids they have, as we'll see. The way that we're going to do this is we're going to use electricity. So this is where like the electrophoresis part comes in. We're going to use electricity to motivate these molecules, these proteins to move through a gel mesh. And in this case, the mesh is made up of polyacrylamide. As the molecules move through the mesh, they're going to separate based on their size. And the reason that they're going to do this is because the bigger molecules, the longer molecules, they're going to get tangled up more in the mesh. And therefore, they're going to travel more slowly. And when you turn off the electricity, which as we'll see is going to, we'll know when to stop it thanks to that loading die. When you turn off the electricity, the bigger things are gonna be higher up and the smaller things are going to be lower down. And in this way, we can then separate these proteins to see what's in a mixture, how big things are, how pure things are, et cetera. But we have a couple problems. One is that proteins, have shapes. They don't just have lengths. They're not just long spaghetti noodles. Instead, they're folded up into um, beautiful and complex shapes. And in order to separate them based on their length, we need to kind of erase that shape or else that shape is going to get in the way. So we need to denature. We need to unfold these proteins. But this leads us to another problem because proteins are folded up for a reason. Typically, there are parts of proteins that are hydrophobic, so they're water avoiding. And then there are parts that are hydrophilic, so parts that water really loves to hang out with. And so proteins usually fold up so that those hydrophobic parts, the parts that water doesn't like, those are kind of bundled up, hunched together in the center of the protein, and then the hydrophilic parts are on the outside in contact with the water. What happens if you unfold a protein is that then you're con getting those, un those hydrophobic parts in contact with the water, and normally this would cause the molecules to all like kind of clump together and aggregate. And if you just have this big precipitate of solid gunk, that's not going to travel well through your gel. So we can't just denature them by like heating them up. Instead, we need to add something that's actually going to keep them soluble. And so sodium dodecyl sulfate, or SDS, is a detergent. It's an artificial soap. And it has this long lipidy tail, this long hydrophobic tail that's good to glob onto those hydrophobic parts of the proteins that you've helped expose with that heat. And then it has a hydrophilic head, so a water-loving head. It has this negatively charged or anionic head, and this is going to have a couple benefits. So we have this lipidy tail that's going to um, allow to kind of coat those hydrophobic regions and protect them from the water. But then what's also special about SDS is that negatively charged head. Now that's the part that water really wants to hang out with. 
And so water is going to be okay hanging out with this molecule. And so we're going to have it so that this SDS is going to coat the molecule and keep it soluble, but um, because it's also able to interact with the water. Because you have these all these negatively charged heads on this protein as well, these negative charges are going to repel one another, and this is going to help keep the protein linear, prevent it from folding back up. Um, and so you're going to get this coating that's kind of proportional to the length, which is going to be important because the negative charge is going to be what's going to propel these proteins through the gel because there's a positive charge at the other end, thanks to that electricity that you're putting through, the electrical gradient you're making with your power box. Which brings us to another benefit of sodium dodecyl sulfate. So proteins may or may not, um, proteins have different charges, so different amino acids, so different protein letters have different charges, um, or most of them don't have a charge at all, but there are some that are positively charged and some that are negatively charged, and proteins each have a different mixture of amino acids, and so proteins are each going to have a different charge. This is also going to depend on the pH and stuff, but I'm not going to get into that. But we're using charge to motivate the proteins through the gel, and so we need to have all the proteins have a negative charge. And we want this negative charge, importantly, to be proportional to the length. And SDS is going to do this for us. So SDS is going to coat the proteins in this uniform negative charge that's going to be proportional to their length. It's going to coat them in a way that's going to protect their hydrophobic regions from clumping together um, and keep these proteins soluble and able to slither through that gel, separating based on their length as opposed to based on their size or just getting clumped up in the well. So that was SDS, and it can act as the naturing agent. But Sometimes you often want to use a reducing agent as well. And so what you'll do is you'll actually add something like DTT or BME to your loading buffer. Um, these are reducing agents. So what they can do is they can break up disulfide crosslinks. So basically one of the amino acid cysteine can form these kind of weakish covalent bonds to other cysteines and more in other posts. But these bonds are going to be vulnerable to break up through DTT or through BME, through these reducing agents, whereas normal covalent bonds are between just like your normal carbons and hydrogens or carbons and oxygens and carbons and nitrogens, all those molecules, all those bonds that are actually making up the protein itself. Those tip, those don't, don't get affected by these reducing agents, but these disulfide crosslinks do. And so if we add a reducing agent, they're going to allow us to break up those disulfide crosslinks. And so often we want to use a reducing agent so that we don't have proteins stuck together or we don't have proteins kind of prevented from unfolding all the way. So you can think of a denaturing agent kind of like if you had a tangled up charm bracelet and you just untangled it, that would be kind of like denaturing. But what if you have a couple of the charms stuck together? And so this could be charms in the same bracelet, and that would prevent you from unfolding it all the way. Or it could be kind of like charms from different bracelets stuck together, and now your proteins would be stuck together. The reducing agent's kind of like a glue be gone or whatever. It can like kind of dissolve that glue and allow you to separate those. So a reducing agent is going to break up those disulfide crosslinks, and the denaturing agent is going to unfold things. And often we use them together in order to really separate these proteins. Um, and so we would have this is like having our glue remover and untangling. In neither case are we actually breaking up those chains and those charm bracelets, though. So those strong covalent bonds are resistant. You can think of those as kind of like those metal stronger metal links. Those aren't going to get affected. But so we typically have, we have our SDS, which is going to denature things. If we want to do reducing conditions, which is usually what we're doing on an SDS page, so we don't have these proteins stuck together or anything, we want to erase everything, we'll add a reducing agent. And often we add this fresh or you add it um, to part, you like keep most of the buffers um, just like out in the bench. And then you add this fresh and then keep aliquots in the freezer because this denaturing agent can kind of go bad over time. Um, and so denaturing agent um, and reducing agent. And again, the reducing agent is kind of like an optional because some people might want to keep these crosslinks together for various reasons, but we typically leave it out. I mean, so we typically put it in. What else is in here? Tris, um, so this is a pH buffer. It's basically just gonna keep the pH stable by giving or taking protons um, depending on what things are going on in the, um, what the pH environment is like in the sample. 
Next, we have glycerol or another heavy um, sugar or something. This is basically just going to help your sample sink and stay sunk in the well while you load your gel. You don't want those samples. Basically, it can take you a couple of minutes to actually load all those samples into the wells, and you don't want your sample just kind of like coming up out of the well um, because you don't have any electricity at this point to kind of be motivating it towards the bottom. All it's got going is diffusion, and diffusion is going to make things kind of randomly move around. Um, and so eventually, it would like just float out of your well. Um, but the glycerol is going to make it heavier, so it's going to make it harder for your sample to kind of just float away. And finally, we have the tracking die. This is just going to let you track the run's progress so you know when to turn off that electricity. This is not showing you protein. It's just showing you the dye. Um, and so this is often bromophenol blue. And basically, it helps you see, well, one for one, it helps you see which lanes you've loaded already. Um, for two, it helps you kind of track the progress of the gel. You can see, oh, I, I overloaded that lane. That looks weird. Or something like that if there's a problem. If your gel stops running or something and you can see that, or there's like a smiling effect, various things like this that you can see by tracking that um, dye front. But the main reason for the dye front is so you know like when to turn it off. And so typically you run the gel until the dye front reaches the end and then you turn it off. This is not showing you proteins, except in the case of like a pre-stained ladder. So these can be really great if you're doing something like a Western blot. Um, basically a ladder is just a combination of these proteins of known size. And you can use a pre-stained one that's actually gonna show you the bands as they run. So you can see like, if you want to know more exactly when you want to run the gel, like maybe you know that you have a big protein so you wanna run it after the dye front loads out, runs out. Um, and so this can help you more optimize when to turn off the electricity to freeze the proteins in place. It also helps you with like a Western blot to see whether you got good transfer. So those are the main components of an SDS page sample loading buffer. We have our SDS, it's going to denature things. If we, uh, optionally, we have the reducing agent. I say optionally, but you often almost always have it, um, the DTT or the BME. Um, you have the TRIS, your pH buffer to keep pH stable glycerol to help your sample sink to the bottom of the well and not float out, and your tracking dye to help you see how things are going and know when to stop. Now you can make your own loading buffer or you can buy loading buffer. Um, and so here's a typical example. You have final concentrations of like 50 millimolar tris, pH 6.8, 2% SDS, 10% glycerol, 1% BME, 12.5 millimeter EDTA, a millimolar EDTA, um, so I don't have EDTA in the other one, but some but some um, recipes do have EDTA and then 0.02% bromophenol, bromophenol blue. So you can see that this was a recipe for as 4X. Um, and so there are different, you, this is what an example of a relative concentration. So typically with these sample loading buffers, they're gonna be given, the concentration is gonna be given in some sort of like relative concentration, relative to the working concentration. So what, what you actually want to use it at. So for example, with that 4X, that tell you it's four times more concentrated than you actually want to use it at. So this is one, basically want one microliter of this per four microliters of total. So you would add one microliter of the, the sample buffer to three microliters of sample. There are also recipes for like a 6X or a 2X. And you can choose what X, what time, like what concentration you want, depending on how much you want to load. So if you have a really dilute sample, you're going to want to load more of it, more volume. And if you want more volume of your sample, you want less volume of your loading buffer. So you can squeeze more into that well, which can only hold a certain amount. Um, plus, you don't want to load like too much because then your band can get kind of like diffuse. So what you want to do is you want to use a higher concentration of stock loading buffers, such as the 6X. I often use a 6X, so here what you have is like one microliter per six microliters total, so I would add one microliter of, sample, of the loading buffer per five microliters of sample. But typically what I'm doing is I actually prepare a lot more than that, and I load like 15 microliters on the gels that I'm using. And what I like to do is I like to prepare extra in case there's a problem. So there might be a loading problem, there might be a running problem, and basically I want to have enough so that I could rerun the whole thing if I have enough sample. If you don't have enough sample, obviously this isn't going to pertain to you, um, but I like to make enough for two loads and a little extra to give wiggle room because you're always going to lose some on the pipette tips and things like this. So I typically prepare 36 microliters and then load 15. Um, and so I would do 30 microliters of my sample plus six microliters of my loading buffer. 
Um, and then I would load 15 of that. And then if there's a problem, I have another backup um, to do this all again. So that was 6x. With 4x, it would be like 30. Um, so it would be like 9 plus 27. For 2x, it would be like 18 plus 18. But again, this is all just going to depend on how much sample you want to load and things like this. So this is just a this is just an example, and you use whatever um, whatever works for you. Um, but then you can just add that to all your samples and voila, run your gel. So hope that helps you make your gel run well.